Good evening, everybody. Welcome to FMA Discussion. This is episode 416, and tonight we have Adelon Najoli. And I'm going to be bringing it up soon. If you're watching, tell us where you're watching from. Smash that like button. If you have questions, please put them on the right-hand side. I will definitely get to them. And we're just getting started. And here he comes. Hey there, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. <laughs> so uh, glad to finally get you on, and uh, I'm looking forward to this. Uh, here you're... I'm honored. Oh, well, yeah, no, no, no. And I hear you're a all-around great guy. Um, you know, so... <laughs> So is uh, so before we get into the deep PTK tri V and the dose methodos and all that, um, what um what was your like before you got an FMA like you know what was your general martial arts did you start like most of us in traditional martial arts or yeah I mean I started really like most of you because uh, you know ninjas throwing stars I'm from New York. Kid. <laughs> yeah, back in the era where you could go to Chinatown and you could just buy whatever. You could buy throwing stars and swords and butterfly. You could just That's do right. anywhere in the Mecca. I mean, like you could buy yeah, anything was, down there. <laughs> prime times. And yeah. uh, a lot of Sunday, Sunday afternoon movies and everything else. Um, but yeah, no, I was I was just kind of the regular dude. And the, I guess the, the one differential was I kind of knew that I wanted to do some martial arts really early on. And I was, you know, I had a, a, a young person's job, like delivering some papers and stuff like that. And I had a local martial arts teacher and uh, my parents weren't super down with it. And so I invested my own money in my first classes, actually. So when I was like 12 years old, 13 years old, I was spending my own money to kind of take classes and everything. Wow. And, uh, yeah, and I was doing some, you know, jujitsu. There was a jujitsu school, school, so I was, you know, taking some classes and doing that kind of thing, which was really awesome. And uh, and then I was really fortunate that even when I hit a really rough patch as a young person, mm. instead of my parents um, having me pull away from all of those extracurricular things, they actually made me go almost all the time. I guess because they wanted me to be in a place. So I would actually, even at that age, when I was in middle school, I mean, I was going to train, you know, four or five times a week. And, yeah. um, you know, in addition to whatever other things I was doing outside of that. So, yeah. It's pretty really incredible, though, at that very early age, like you don't hear that a lot, like 12, 13, not only are you paying for your own lessons, but indirectly, they're kind of instilling you this work ethic. And being responsible for yourself. I mean, mostly you hear that in teens, you know, okay, time for yeah. you to get a job, you're 18, but like you right. were 12, 13, you know? Yeah. I mean, you know, martial arts in that time, I, I think I was always a very kind of like internal, introverted and introspective person. And so mm -hmm. it felt like a really good opportunity for me to do some kind of processing that I felt like I needed to do. And it definitely provided kind of a secondary family yeah. in a lot of regards. So. I got one of your friends just messaged me and I'm going to try to tag him. I think he might be having some issues finding where you're running live. And um, Kojo Johnson. Oh, Kojo. Yeah. Long time friend from Capoeira, actually. I'm looking yeah. for the link. Okay. And look in the wrong place. Okay. I'm going to just, I'm going to, I'm just going to message him quick and just tell him to go to my wall. It's made public. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, to my oh, he made it. It looks like he made it on. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, okay. All right. I was just about to message you. <laughs> I'm, glad, <laughs> I'm glad you uh, glad you found us. And we got folks jumping in saying hello. We got Eric O'Brien. And we got Royce Ramos. He's in your area. This by this. Yeah, city. definitely. Catherine. All right. And we got Kojo. Who, who uh, yeah, Kojo's down in DC. Oh, okay. DC. Okay. Yep. So, all right. So, you, what was the art? I mean, um, what were you doing? What was the traditional art? You're saying jujitsu? Yes, yeah, so I was doing jujitsu during that time. And then once I got into high school, I was wrestling and wrestled in high school and in university as well. And nothing like super profound, but I was doing it the whole time. And it was really great as far as like 
you know, work ethic and conditioning and doing yeah. something that's real, you know, application oriented. And so I did that for a long time. And then while I was in college as well, um, there was an Aikido studio kind of nearby and the guy let me come on a discount in exchange. It was very old school. You know, he let me clean up before class and I would clean up All after right. class and stuff like that. But he let me have a good deal on taking class. And so yeah. I was doing that and um, stayed with him for a while and then did some boxing and finally made my way into Capoeira. That started actually out in Denmark. I was living out in Denmark for a while and um, yeah, and then here we are today, you know, like kind of went through the journey and made it to years. So yeah, we're gonna definitely touch touch on the capoeira because I want to see the the influence of anything into your FMA. But before we go there, yeah. so your <clears throat> your first FMA experience, based you know when we were taught in the dry run there, you were saying lightning, right? Lightning scientific. Yeah. So, so how did you uh, run into that? I mean, uh, how did you get exposed to that? So I was, you know, I'm here in New York, or I'm, at least I'm based in New York, and finally determined after a lot of years of doing capoeira and running a group that I had actually time and space enough in my life to look into some Filipino martial arts, which was something I had been interested in for a long while. You know, I'd seen in like film and media and all these other and heard about from friends and had an interest and finally found I had some time. And so I did some research and kind of checked out some schools. And there was a group out here called um, Contao Cali Cruzada. And it was with a guy named Datu Rich Acosta. I know, um, know of him. Yeah. Yeah. He is a really skilled uh, practitioner. I will say that he is a person that when you see him and when you see him perform his art, it looks like it harkens back to some old Filipino royalty. Like his posture and his precision and yeah. speed and accuracy, it really is like kind of stunning in a, in a regard, you know, it reminds me of the beauty of the art. And wow. so, um, huh. so he and his brother, actually Rico, they had developed their kind of like a family system that in large part, its, its baseline was lightning scientific and modern Arnis. And then obviously it integrated some other elements. So it had some Aikido there. They had some kickboxing and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, as, as far as a lot of their base, a lot of it was the lightning scientific. <clears throat> and their primary mentor was um, Grandmaster Vic Sanchez out there in Marikina. Okay. So, okay. Yeah, so I was training with them and it was good timing and it was good work and he's very um um deliberate and intentional mm -hmm. about the teachers which was something i kind of needed in that time and it yeah. was also good timing because i knew i was going to start heading out to the philippines to work soon so um you know i spent a little time there and then was able to bridge that later so because <clears throat> his name came up i had interviewed some new jersey guys uh, <laughs> and they started with him um, before they, you know, went down and did their own thing. So the name definitely, uh, yeah. that name's been mentioned in there. So with regards to the lightning scientific, was it a lot of stick and dagger? Or, I mean, was it, um, had that flavor to it? And a little bit. I mean, it was a lot of single stick. <clears throat> it's a lot of long range, um, a lot of footwork, which was something that I already was accustomed to and kind of had in the an affinity for and something that I really enjoyed was things that required a lot of position and footwork and kind of physicality to mobility. them. Okay. Um, yeah, a lot of mobility in, ingrained in it. Um, obviously speed, obviously accuracy. Um, yeah, so most of the time while I was involved with it, it was a lot of single stick and a lot of espari daga. Yeah, and so yeah. those were the two things that we spent a lot of time with. And then even in the Philippines with, with Grandmaster Vic, that was his focus a lot of times was a lot of his body daga and a lot of single stick. All right. All right. That's kind of, that's kind of consistent with everybody yeah. I've had on regarding lightning, you know, Yeah. Um, in there. And we got Kurt chicken salute from Alaska. All right. Um, all right. So now, okay. You go to Philippines for work. 
you train there and ironically it's where you find ptk so you didn't find new york city <laughs> new york yeah, city. <laughs> yeah which there's a whole bunch out here i find I mean, out. not bill mcgrath <laughs> not greg Alon, yeah. not tom bizio <laughs> yeah like everyone's out here didn't know but <laughs> i'm gonna go to the philippines right. there's nobody here in new york so how would you get yeah. you know i know you're training with vic as far as lightning how would you yeah. cross bridges with uh ptk there yeah it's a uh... And, you know, and speaking of that New York thing, it's funny because when people out here are like, I can't find, you know, I just want to train on my own because I can't really find a teacher. And I always say, like, within New York in this region, we definitely have a higher density of oh like master God. level teachers than they have in the Philippines. Like, oh, yeah. you know, I think that's like, yeah. just within an hour and a half of here, you can hit like so many. So it's crazy. No, it, like if you like, you could say that about Connecticut where I live. Yeah. I mean, New York City. Yeah, it's like <laughs> you go around there, down to Philly, upstate New York, New Jersey. I mean, there's just so much, so it's crazy. Yeah, that yeah, um, that doesn't uh, that doesn't constitute a New York man. Connecticut, yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so you're yes. over there. How how did it happen? Yeah, so I was um, living in Makati. So I was working for an organization that does. Um, what I do actually is kind of help design and um, teach pedagogy around working with young people and um, curriculum for working young, with young people in kind of like long-term temporary housing. So if there's like a natural disaster and people are moved into a place that initially was built for a few months and ends up being years long housing, we start developing programming for that place to really support young people. And so I was out there for that. And, um, you know, I already kind of established I was going to train with Grandmaster Vic. And, you know, you're going out to Marikina every morning to do that before work. And uh, it would be hours because, you know, traffic in Manila is like insane. It's, a nightmare. it's like <laughs> insane, you know. I hear. Um, but I was making it, you know, I was doing the, you know, everything from the jeepneys to cabs to whatever I had to do to get out there each morning. And then, um, Somebody was like, you know, there's a guy who teaches right around the corner, basically, at this place called the Salcedo Tennis Club, like down in the racquetball courts. And uh, so I was like, oh, yeah, you know, I'll go over and check that thing out. And uh, I went over there and it was Kit and like a small cadre of people, um, mm -hmm. some guys who ended up being really kind of pivotal for me in a lot of regards too, who were training there at the time. And... Uh, yeah, I just really fell in love with like what we were doing there. Mm -hmm. um, I think some of it was because it was super challenging for me um, in different kinds of ways than the Lightning Scientific was. And so mm -hmm. I liked the fact that it was so much stuff that I was kind of uncomfortable with. And I just wanted New to be and challenging. OK. And uh... it was a lot of like close quarter stuff, a lot of close quarter knife stuff, things that I mean, obviously are just very, you know, they can give you a lot of anxiety. And I felt like that was, I needed to really like put myself in that as much as possible in order to develop nice. some of wow. yeah. So, all right. So, in, I mean, obviously something really resonated with you because, I mean, you wanted to go, you wanted to stay there and go deeper and yeah. I mean, which obviously you have, um, yeah. you know, what could you say just for the folks who are watching, like what was like just so noticeable as far as the difference between a lightning training and the PTK? Um, well, one was because we, the, the, and I'm sure you've heard from all of the other guys you've had on here about this idea of uh, transfer of technology. So the mm -hmm. idea that we're just very consistently working on developing attributes for a variety of different weapon systems. And so I enjoyed the fact that there wasn't, um, it wasn't like you have to wait 15 years before you get to use the Sibat. It's not yeah, like you yeah, gotta yeah, wait yeah, yeah, years. <laughs> yeah, that's you're not ready for that yet. Now you, you know, you just stick with it. But it really was like I'm just putting things in your hands and I'm um, getting you to work with all of them. And I'm trying to actually, as far as teaching method or pedagogy, um, teach in a way that is simple and clear and makes you feel you're developing capacity rapidly. 
And that was something I really enjoyed about PTK was definitely there was that feeling of, oh, I'm really, you know, I'm developing skills, even at this level, even at this like preliminary, young, mm -hmm. like newborn time, I'm developing things that actually feel applicable and feel to some certain degree intuitive. So, yeah. yeah. So when you were there with Kit, were you getting so I know you touched upon the weapons, were you getting basically everything? I mean, you're getting you're getting sword, you're getting stick, you're getting mm -hmm. long and short, knife. I mean, was that was that fair? Yeah, we were getting to do all the things. Um, a lot of knife stuff. And um, you know, and then I would obviously travel in and out and around the, the country a bit and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I'd get some other opportunities as well. But as far as with Kit, it was kind of the wide array. So it was a lot of you know, stick and double stick, a lot of spotty dog. I was there for about two years straight at that I point. I was going to ask, like how long? Yeah. Okay, but so you were there, that's quite a while for you to Yeah, get. I was there yeah. for, you know, and then all the years following that, I would go back out for about six months a year. So I was getting oh, quite wow. a bit of time. Okay. Yeah, I would go every winter and I would go usually during the early part of autumn. So, yeah. You know, it was, it was good. And there were a couple of guys there who definitely didn't, uh, you know, take it easy on me. There's a guy, Mike Seepersod out there who, you know, he uh, he taught me a lot of stuff by hitting me in the face a whole bunch and everything. <laughs> but I, I appreciated it. You know, I just kind of needed guys who weren't really worried about that. So. Who did, you know, again, raise, you know, raise your level in, in there. And uh, yeah, wow. Absolutely. So, so folks are watching. Kit, again, did he coming more from the tri V aspect? Yeah, I mean, you know, Kit's first teacher, you know, his early on was with Tuhan Ramel. Those were some of his, like, introductions into the art. He, him and then also actually some students of Tuhan Phil. So he had a lot of exposure to, like, Chris Gord um, and some of those guys who now you mm -hmm. see out with um, Maelstrom out in Vancouver. Um, some of those guys, Zach Garcia, you know, those guys were peers of Kit's, but they were also mentors, I think, at the same time. And mm. so as much as he was getting kind of tri V from Tuhan Mel, he was also getting these tastes of Doce Methodos um, from all of these other sources. And I think Kit, with a very academic mindset, and he's very um, curious in that regard, I think some of the Dulce Methodos just really appeals to him because it gives him just like this expansive library of stuff to explore. And so I was really getting kind of both of the things. You know, I think he kind of starts us all off with the tri -V, And yeah. then if he sees some students develop a little bit more curiosity about it, he works some of the Dulce Methodos with them as kind of a supplementary thing. You know, so interesting because I've had a bunch of PTK people on some you know, from the old Dothan Methodos, some from the Tri-V, some like yourself that got exposed to both. Mm -hmm. And uh, they and generally the feedback span, when you're exposed to both, your clarity, your understanding just evolves. Uh, where mm -hmm. now, you, in other words, some of the folks I, um, that I had that just did the Tri-V, one of their goals was to explore Dothan Methodos to further expand and expound on their understanding yeah. and all that, where the Tri-V was very good for that immediate functionality, kind right. of the bridge system, the, you know, just getting, again, just from talking from numerous people on here, including Tuan here. You know? Yeah, I think if you, if you went to a country with your basic level of Spanish that you learned in mm -hmm. high school, you would be surviving, right? You would get around and you could say, yeah. give me water, show oh, me a bathroom, <laughs> like, where is bus? Like, and you would be able to function and do all of the things and probably function successfully. And then just over time, you might decide, oh, I want to express more subtlety. So now I might say, mm -hmm. oh, I'd like a glass of ice water, but hold the ice. Right yeah. now, I'm like going to more kind of a subtle layer of that thing. Neither one is better or worse, but I'm right. just exploring the kind of more nuance maybe in that regard. So I think yeah, that, yeah, no, I think that's a that's a great analogy. But uh, it's just interesting when you when I have the folks on here because you know one of the things on the show is that just by virtue of doing these interviews, I mean, I've gotten like a lot of clarity on just I mean systems I'm not even really involved in, but just hearing. Right constant themes and 
being repeated during these interviews you, you know what i mean it, it's really interesting and uh right. one of these kind of repeating things has been the tri v versus dose methodos you know yeah. and that uh, um so you're going back to kit you're, you stay there two years now you're going back <clears throat> yeah. um at what point did you make a conscious decision that you wanted to seek out other instructors and why so um well, there are a couple of things. So, I, you know, I've moved back to the States. <clears throat> and so I needed to find a cluster of guys to train with out here. Mm. And so Kit, along with Tuhan Ramel, who I had met at that point, and I was also in contact with Grand Tuhan, they were like, oh, you know, there's a group of guys in New York, um, the PTK Elite group. And so they had just started this guy who now Agalon Francis Estrada and uh, Aglin Nate Chin, who's actually now out in Berkeley. And a couple other guys had started a, a small study group out here in New York and Brooklyn. And uh, so they were like, yeah, you know, th there's some guys who will be kind of peers to you and, and they're also doing work and they're kind of training. Mm -hmm. And so their primary um, point of reference was Tuhan Ramel. And oh. so, that would be, yeah, so they were primarily Tuhan Ramel, although we, all would have Grand Tuhan out quite a bit because New York was kind of, you know, it's his historical landing spot. Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah. We're the place for that. So, you know, through those years, then I started to develop this real relationship with him. And from and what I got from both Tuhan Ramel and Grand Tuhan was this sense of um, legacy and history and, um, maybe some of the whys of certain mm -hmm. things. Why is a thing called what it is? Or why do we maintain a subsystem within the art that might seem irrelevant to some? Or why is it important in this way or that? And so I think that was important to me. And I also, just on a personal level, um, have a lot of... <clears throat> I think it's really important, this idea of connecting to kind of like the roots of things and to yeah. the history of things and also to use martial practices or combative practices also as a tool in communities for teaching our young people about how to have better relationships with their elders, how to mm. have better relationships in their communities, how to relate and learn the etiquette of various communities. And so having them as kind of some kind of core points or central points also provided that element to the art as well for me and just gave me some points of reference. And then I came in contact with Tuhan Jared after that. I think first probably in the Philippines, at one of our large like Southeast Asia conferences or something, but oh, more and yeah. more. Yeah, back when we were all doing everything together, back in the time when it was like back when everybody was a happy family, and you know, together. and it was like you would go <laughs> and it was off the leaf, the meter with the just the skill level and the talent in the house was just burning, you know, it was super nice. Um, but that's when I met Tuan Jared, and I just really liked his approach. You know, the, the thing that I think I get most from Jared is he really sees people and he determines why it is that they're here for the art or why it is they're here for the practice. So as opposed to the practice coming first and being like, I am just going to load you with this stuff and it's your job to learn all of these things and to take all of this on. Instead, it almost seems like it comes from the other end where he is looking at the person and saying, what is it you need from this art? And so let's make it so that that's accessible to you. And ah, I think that's an ingenious like way to do yeah. that. As opposed to just giving the same thing to everybody, regardless of where their background is or what yeah. they want, maybe. Um, I like that approach, actually. Um, yeah. And that probably, I'm guessing that probably comes, maybe has worked with uh, other agencies and all that. So really trying to dial in and what they need, you know, whether it's job related, so, you know. Yeah. I mean, in many regards, it's probably super connected to how he learned from Grand Tuhan as well, because mm -hmm. I think that in his generation of instructors, that's how GT taught them. He was like, you learn this because that's what you need to know. And you learn this other thing because that's what you need to know. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
he seems to still apply that. And he has all, always been really open, all of them have, um, about the fact on my part that I just refuse to be political about my training. I'm like, look, I'm going to be part of this organization and train with this guy and train with that. And you're going to have to actively give me a reason why I shouldn't do that. Like why you're going to have to say out loud Amen. why it's a problem. Otherwise I'm just going to keep learning, you know, as much as I can. So I know and that, I like that, you know, they're, they're cool about it. So that's fantastic. And that's another thing that's come up, you know, through these years of interviews, like where some folks, it's like indentured servitude, you know what I mean? They can't leave and go train in, uh, somewhere else. And um, yeah. I just think it's terrible. Like the student's the most important aspect and just to be reined in or not feel like he can yeah. seek other people out for further understanding. And I find instructors that do that or embrace that, yeah. I find that the student will come back around because they really appreciate that that teacher that really invokes that and encourages that you know um yeah. that's just that's been, that's been my my feeling and understanding and i do it with my students say look you know i don't have all the answers you owe to yourself to go out there and find out what you can and bring it back you might find something that i didn't know that you can bring back to us you know you know it's like you're you're trying to hold both of those ideas though simultaneously right because you also, as a teacher, are saying, I would like to have you develop at least some level of core understanding or some fundamentals so that you can actually take advantage of the opportunities when you go yeah. to see someone else, right? I don't yeah. want, you don't need to go to Grand Tuhan and learn how to sw swing a number one strike. Like, yeah. I will do that with you. Yeah. Do that with me for a while. And so that by the time you go spend time with someone like that, you're really able to take advantage of it. So yes, perhaps in the beginning, I'm like, you know. Yeah, right, yeah, the student's got a month in, yeah. But like in your you case, know, a couple of years, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. Then at that point, you know, we're grown folk. Like no one's telling you where to be or to not. It's not like a job. Yeah, like I can't, but. I couldn't imagine telling my students, like, like I can't, I ran into a couple incidents where yeah. I didn't, for various reasons, did enjoy the faction, did enjoy the person, whatever it may be. So what I told them, don't go. I said, look, I want you to go and I want you to tell me what your experience was. Because right. they could have a completely different experience than me. So for me to go just tell them, well, you know, back in so and so, I had this miserable, you know what I mean? That's to right, me, that's right, right, right. Let yeah. them, you know, find out on her, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. They're learning something, they're hearing something in a different way, maybe even the same thing that you said to them 50 times, and yeah. this other person says it again, and they're like, oh, did you ever hear this thing? Yes, I've said that to you before. But you, just said you, just chose not to, you just chose not to write it down or remember it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, all right, so are you currently, you're still with Jared, Two on Mel and Kit, correct? Yep, exactly. Okay. And so those are your kind of your three primary. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So what can you tell? I guess um, about the three some similarities, differences as far as their approach to methodology. Sure. And, and that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so I guess I would start with uh, Kit, and um, you know, Kit definitely again, is very much a constant learner. So mm -hmm. he is very invested in the relationship he's been developing with Tuhan Philip and all the learning he's been doing from him. Um, and he is constantly reevaluating the things that he has learned previously and trying to figure out. He almost sometimes it's kind of challenging if you're not used to Kit because he's you know, he's spinning and he's teaching so much stuff and you have to be able to, one, keep up with the pace that his mind is working at and the way that he's kind of working through things um, and also really enjoy the fact that he loves the fact that you will develop these, your own interpretations of things. So a lot of times he will teach me a bunch of stuff, not teach me applications for them, and say that's your job to figure out how to apply some of these things. And I think that that's a really interesting approach to stuff. 
Um, and he wants me, you know, the other thing I think that I really enjoy about Kit, and I know I'm always like <clears throat> highlighting him, maybe because he doesn't come to the States as much or because he's very quiet on social media. So I feel like I have to, you know, cheerlead for him. Um, but he, for all of his students, is a huge advocate, you know? Mm. So when there were groups in Brazil that really wanted to have Kit come out there, he was like, no, I can't do that, but in, I'll send in Jolie down there to do that with you. Or, oh, you know, there's a over here. Yeah. And that was new for me from a teacher, you know? Oftentimes, yeah, I like, right. hold, it, hold it close. So yeah, yeah, right. I know you can't go. I'm, I'm yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. That's that's my that's my paycheck or something. So, um, so Tua Mel is another super generous person who I think is taking teaching as the opportunity for him, perhaps to recapture a whole bunch of time of his previous training. So we were talking a little bit before about the pandemic, and mm. I would say that the amount of training <clears throat> that I got from Tuhamel during that era, both online and off, I mean, it, it, the, the wealth is kind of incalculable. He would go through these old notebooks from when he was a kid and be like, oh, like, what's on this page? Hey, guys. And he would just get maybe just 10 or 12 of us, teachers from around the world. He'd be like, mm -hmm. meet me on Zoom. And he would do like a four-hour session on Zoom, just like, going through all these different details of things and doing translations of stuff oh, and, wow. you know, talking about language and history and stuff. And so I just felt like, you know, what the value of this thing is, I mean, you couldn't put a number on it. And yeah. he was just offering this to us because he wanted to see us be better teachers. And he was like, I just want to know that you're out in the world and that someone's maintaining as much of this stuff as possible. And so I always appreciate that. And I continue to appreciate the fact that he's very supportive of me. And again, mm -hmm. you know, even with me being a person who, you know, as much as I work with all three of these teachers in many regards, you know, I um, stand in front of the PTTA, like that's where I'm getting my rank through is through Jared okay. and through Kit and everything else. Um, but never does that discourage or dissuade Tuhan Mel from teaching me or being right. Even though you're being ranked, yeah, you're not supposed to know. That's not nice. never yeah. have felt that, you know. Never yeah, seen you know, I had him on. I, I thought he was exceptionally friendly. I, yeah. I just, I thought he was. He just seemed like a great guy. Um, yeah, we just need to like leave it. Leave, let people be good. You know, yeah. like we want people to be problematic. We need to like let people be good. Yeah, um, no, he's uh, very. Outgoing, friendly. I just, yeah. yeah, I just thought he was, yeah, seemed like a, just Absolutely. a great guy to be around and learn from, you know? Yeah. And then uh, Jared, I think, is that, like I said, he, um, he understands, like, martial arts as it exists in the West. Like, he has a real clarity about, like, he was like, I know what the structure needs to be. Mm. I know how students perceive um, organization and what organization looks like to them. I know what they need from structures in order to get the maximum out of it. Um, and so he's been able to order his curriculum in such a way, his programming. Um, he's very, I think, at least from what I've seen, he's very deliberate about his relationships with students as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a really particular thing that a lot of teachers don't know how to navigate, but he's very you know, particular in the way that he manages his relationships and his time and stuff. And um, I think that's something that is a subtle thing that perhaps sometimes um, is not always recognized, but that he does particularly well. Um, and he makes sure to carry himself, you know, his his public carriage, um, I think, does a lot Very of well. to the art. You know what I mean? Oh, like, no, I do it. Rambling, talking yeah. crap, being a horrible person, saying things about, like he carries himself very well he as does. a great representative of what instructors should look yeah. like. You know? He really does. I mean, he's he's highly respected and comes in high regard. I am on there, very professional, uh, very reluctant to speak when he was on here negatively on anything. Um, right. Yeah, I mean, you know, and there's no... 
you know, I, you would know this better than me, but he seems like he's got a fast growing organization. Right. <laughs> and yeah. it's not coincidence, I'm guessing. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I mean, I've checked his programs out and all that, and uh, I could see why it's the structured organization, you know, the silver, the gold and all that and what he's doing. And then you got the sub programs based on, you know, if you want more into the uh, military or law enforcement aspect. Right, right, right. So, yeah, he's clearly doing something right for sure. Yeah, he's figuring it out. So, yeah. Now, so you get most, so, it sounds like you, I mean, obviously with uh, Tuan Jared, definitely the Tri V though, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And then exactly. with Tuan uh, Kit and others, then you're getting, you're getting some of the Dose Methodos and that. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, um, it has been a great opportunity for me, you know? I mean, yeah. you go to a BTTA event and like those dudes want to fight. Like <laughs> that, that part of it is like, that's a given. Like you're not going there if you're not interested in, fighting and sparring and doing that practice. Yeah. And what's nice for me is, yes, like there's an aspect of me that loves academia and loves study and research. And mm -hmm. I also like the idea of seeing, can I apply that thing when someone else does, doesn't give a crap about that, you yeah. know, yeah, yeah, like, you really oh, don't they don't care. care about all that stuff. And they yeah, you know, and I'm like, oh, but could I pull off this thing in an environment where the person is not trying to play yeah. the same kind of games that I am. And that makes it super interesting for me. You so got some bangers like in there. I mean, you yeah. got Lamont. I mean, yeah. you got, I mean there's you some got bangers. Jason in there. Jason, I, Lamont. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. So, those, I mean, and they're, they're, those they're guys. Cool. Yeah. So, they're, they're in cool another cool category because they are super heady and stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, they got some fighters. I mean, you can't yeah. deny that. I mean, um, have you ever, and it, it, you know, no, no harm, no foul here. I um, mean, if you haven't, have you ever like trained with any on um, anybody under the Bill McGrath faction or no? The only person who I've really had the opportunity to spend time with has been Tuan Jat, and actually, Tuan he Jett. had me up to do something up in Rochester, and you know, we've shared some time because he's been really great about offering online opportunities. So I've had the chance to do some online stuff with him. And so just in that regard, um, Bill is super close. You know, it's unfortunate that I haven't had as much. And you know, what's even funny is that for a time, <clears throat> I had a study group in Beacon, New York, which we did touch base with Bill about yeah. because he's not doing regular class. You know, he's just doing workshops and there was some people who wanted to do regular class. And so we touched base with Tom Bill and he was like, yeah, that's fine. Like, I don't do that. So go ahead. Um, yeah. But yeah, I would love to make more opportunities for it. Mostly yeah, just curious. I think the teaching style is so different. Yeah. So I know they're both in New York and I know they're, I mean, he's more obviously the Dose Methodos and, uh, yeah. and all that. Um, wow. Um, so when you, do you have a preference like, you know, I ask when I get folks on here that being exposed to both, I really like to hear like what they like at each aspect. So, you know, for the folks who are watching, we got some new folks coming. We got Brian, Renee, Paul, Terry. Okay. All right. Um, and Royce, I just want to catch up on, make sure I'm not missing any questions here. And we got Andres from New Jersey, Frank, and IG from New York City. All right. Um, so what could you tell, I guess, I mean, I, I guess it would be hard for you to say you have a preference over one, but like, what do you like, I guess, that you could tell the folks, you know, the benefits of trading both and what you like? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, that is a hard one it, because it kind of lends a little bit to things I think about training, whatever martial art it is, you know, whether it's Kali or wrestling or capoeira or whatever the thing is that um, all of these new things that you're learning to a certain degree, I think they're trying to unlock things that you just, that you've forgotten. Mm. You know, when you're young, at you're younger, 
you're moving so naturally. You're so in your body and almost fluid in the way that you're processing things that are abstract and then manifesting them physically. Mm. And slowly but surely over time, through a variety of reasons, I'm sure, um, things get stymied or they become blockages in the way that you move or you respond to certain things. Um, And so I almost think that teaching a lot of times, the intention is almost to try and unlock some of that stuff to get you back to a place where you are moving so organically and naturally that you are not, and I'm sure you've heard this before, but I'm not distinguishing between like, oh, is this a Tri-V movement or is this like a Dose Methodos? I'm just like doing things um, Mm. because now I'm unlocking um, my mobility. I'm unlocking my thought process. I'm taking away obstacles from what I have the capacity to do or to not do. And so I think, you know, the, the Tri-V gave me some format and some platform the Dose Methodos, I think, has been a really good reminder that there's all of these other variables that I can utilize. There are tools that I already have in my hands that I just mm. didn't realize. And so they both do very kind of different things for me. So, okay. You know. Would you highly recommend after somebody's doing tri V and they got a decent background, decent understanding to go into Dose Methodos? Yeah, I mean, I, that's my perspective, which, you know, obviously a whole bunch of people will disagree with, but I generally would say, yeah, do tri V as your mm. baseline um, so that you have capacity, right? You need to be able to, you know, when I'm teaching, I'm saying, you know, my things are. I need you to, you know, I want you to learn to love the art. Mm-hmm. I want you to learn a level of fightability. And I want you to enjoy the time that you're spending here and learn how to be in community with people. So just like these basic things. And try V, I think, helps you get to those points most rapidly, right? So you're okay. developing fightability. You're feeling super empowered. Um, you are able to interact because you are developing a baseline of language, basically, physical language it might be, but you're developing language so you can communicate with other people. Mm -hmm. And I mean, not only other PTK people, but if you can swing a number one, like you could go to some other FMA school and go and take a class, like fundamentals, right? And so I think Tri-V gives you a lot of that. And then I think the Dose Methodos, at least for me, was a thing or is a thing that I think keeps teachers continually engaged, um, Mm. helps them format their ideas around teaching. So it helps them develop structures about how to teach certain things, even because all of those methodos is existing in Tri-V. You know, those methodos might just be a means for me to think about how do I structure this class or that, or have a pool of information that I can pull from and um, and kind of continue to teach and ke- and continue mm-hmm. to keep people inspired. And also, it ends up being a tool for me to keep myself engaged. You know, inspired things and the I'm more. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, so. yeah I, you know, it's funny. Um, again, you know, I've had a few shows on this, and it just really interests me, like this, the, you've got these two methodologies, but they're not so, like, so far removed. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, you know, just by talking to people on here, I thought they were like two completely different animals. But by virtue of the shows, I'm like, wait, no. You know what I mean? So it's been really educating and neat to kind of yeah. see that. And a lot of folks that have been on here discussing the two have mentioned stuff that you mentioned that, you know, while the Tribe is a platform, those methods will help you govern how you run your classes and what you yeah. in, in, in there. And yeah, that's, that's, that's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, probably during some other time and probably this went led to a lot of GT's kind of evolution and transition to working more in the Tri-V is that it just became too heady. You know, it got so heady that people kind of forgot, well, you are also supposed to be fighting here. Like, remember that that is kind of one of our first priorities. And it is one of the things that I like about FMA in general, right? It's one of the few realms, if you look at martial arts that come from um, historically colonized or disenfranchised people, 
they are mm. the martial arts that never forget that they are combative arts first, right. right? They never kind of sacrifice this level to think so highly philosophically that they weren't going to continually remind that they are combative at their core. And so Tri V, I think, was GT trying to remind that as well. I'll reintroduce yeah. that. I got yeah. it. Okay. That makes so, sense. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. So at what point did you start teaching? I mean, when you got back to the States? Um, the first couple of years when I got back to the States, I was just training with the with the guys over there. Um, you know, because like I said, at that point, I was still... I would go back to the Philippines generally every winter. So I would go mm. from February through April. And then I would go back there two other times. I would go at the very beginning of summer, kind of early June for a month. And then mm. I would go in autumn for a little bit. And so I was, you know, just kind of in my teaching place and wasn't structured enough of my time here to really be doing class. But then when I became La Kanguro in um, 2014, I guess. That's when I started doing class of my own. And um, part of that was because I felt like there was a, since I was mostly just taking class, there was a whole bunch of stuff that I was learning from Kit that I didn't feel like I was having the opportunity to expose people to. And like I said before, with him being one of the few of these teachers who does not come to the States, I felt like it was really special, a gift that he had given me, and that mm -hmm. it was something I wanted to make sure it got shared with other people, you know, on this side of the ocean. So I started doing class then. Okay. Yeah. Did you find when you're coming here and you're gaining information, did it, did it give you a, a better and clear understanding just by transmission to other to students? Yeah, I mean, I think it always is that. I mean, I, I'm already a very um, intentional and kind of a hard ass, like kind of deliberate person in my practices and just like the way that I teach is very structured and the way I write career. I mean, not just in Kali, but like in the world when I was a teacher in schools and things like that. And um the way I learned, Kojo is on here from Capoeira, and he knows my teacher who I had for a long time and would be like, you know, your toe needs to be pointed like this, and then the angle of the shoulders needs to be, you know, he was very like that. Um, and, and so what that, you know, that has its downsides, but what it, its good sides were, I was always very observant around body mechanics and structure and mm being able to try and note or observe what's going on with a person in their body that might be holding them back or might be causing them not to generate what it is that they're trying to generate. Um, yeah. And so, you know, teaching just gave me more opportunities to practice that as a skill. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So um, with your students and all that and respects to them, do you give them mostly try V or you give them a little both? Or... I would say in the all of the Yakan stuff, I pretty much do all try V stuff. Up to, so up to yeah, okay, all right. Oh yeah, all through like Yakan one, two, and three, which is kind of the first three of those ranks, I do all try V stuff, and you know with little pieces to kind of get people prepared as far as mechanics and stuff, but. Yeah. And then as far as Doce Methodos, it's usually in the Lacan ranks, um, partly because some of those people are starting to, you know, they might be running a study group mm. or they've developed an, a strong enough base of fundamentals that now they're just starting to think about how to put them all together more okay. or interested in being a teacher. So, yeah, usually that's how I do it. So, what, all right, because you touched on a few different ranks there. So what is rank? It goes in order. So, and and again, you know, they probably, you go to whichever organization and they will add some and and take some out and subtract yeah, some. Some Jared. But, um, but with Jared, it's like you have Yakan 1, 2, and 3, 
Okay. Um, so that's the first three. And then you have Lakan, one, two, and three. So Yakan are all the like student ranks and preparing, okay. to, in, you know, Lakan, one, two, and three are all of the kind of intermediate or students who are more interested in working towards teacher stuff. All right. Okay. Lakan Guru, which is basically like an apprentice teacher or a person who is in the process of learning to instruct. And so there's a one, two, and three in that. Um, then Guru, same thing, about three years of that. And he's tried to be a lot more deliberate now, at least as far as in-person stuff. And I will say Pekiti University has its own kind of track, but in-person looks like this. Okay. Um, so Guru, one, two, and three. And then Matasnu Guru, which um, talks about like kind of a level, a level of mastery in terms of skill. Um, right. And so that is still an instructor rank. It has three within it, Isa, you know, Dalawa and Tatlo. Mm -hmm. um, and so then it moves after Matasnoguro, then you go into another group, which is Agalan and Mandala. And then I think Agalan has three in its rank, like another Isa, Dalawa and Tatlo. And Mandala has roughly five in there. Oh, right. And Mandala has five levels. Okay. Yeah, I think Mandala people are Mandala for a much longer stint of time. A lot of it is organizational and working mm. on structuring community and helping support other teachers, helping support right. groups. So that takes a little bit, I guess, more time in terms of involvement. And then it goes into Tuhan and yeah, all of the different Hagdan, which are in Tuhan. So, oh, yeah. wow. Yeah, there's quite a few. Okay, all right. Because I've, I've heard, I've you tried heard to simplify it some, you know, just by making it three in each, because mm -hmm. otherwise it was like kind of crazy how everything people were just kind of skipping around all over the place, and so yeah, yeah, yeah. You no, know. it's good. It's some more to there. Yeah, I mean, again, yeah. it looked like a. You just go on the website there. It looks a like very well organized, structured. Yeah, you know. definitely. Um, yeah, you know, if I had didn't have any so so many pans. Pots on the, on the stove, but <laughs> like, taking out one more thing is just, would be yeah, just really you know, stupid. You know, <laughs> just be, like you know, and I, yeah, I, I hate you do that, and then you can't follow through, or because you've just got too much going on, and it's just, I, I really do, though. I think, you know, when you're learning whatever thing it is you're learning, you're developing so much, particularly when you've just developed so much of a skill set in that thing then it's more kind of conceptual you're kind of researching. So I don't even know if it's a matter of like, oh, now I need to start from the beginning and do 20 years yeah. of PTK. Yeah. I just need to spend some time, you know, maybe practicing or sparring with someone who does some PTK or having some conversations and starting getting the ideas and see how they apply to things that you're already doing. Yeah. Um, in that way. So, yeah. That's true. Yeah. If you got like, yeah, if you got a decent background, I mean, then you can kind of extract and, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Your conversation or like interaction, you know what I mean? Um, wow. Um, <laughs> wow. 200. <laughs> he is the master of puns. He is like, a, he is definitely, oh, if he has mastered anything, he has mastered the pun. Uh, Renee, Renee is, yeah, uh, he he just kills me, man. He just that guy is just too funny. Um, so, uh, how do you? So, with your students, like, how do you introduce sparring with them? Um, so, um, I so as far as sparring. Um, in the beginning, a lot of it is just kind of, is very structured. So it's like some hand hunting, some distance sparring, yeah. maybe some padded stick stuff. And then I don't do any live stick stuff until they're in the yakan, at least. And for a couple of reasons. One, just because... It's just not interesting to me. Maybe that's just selfish. I'm like... Just seeing people who like are not actually deliberately trying to do anything in particular and are just running around getting hit and hitting each other. Swinging for the fences. Yeah, yeah. Like it's just not super interesting to me. And you can just kind of do that when I'm not around. But if you can do that. Yeah, do that some other time, you know. Um, so I prefer 
you know, when at that point I'm like, oh, okay, like now we're actually trying to do some things and you have some specific objectives. And even then, oftentimes I might be fairly structured in some of the practice. So I might be like, you are only allowed to use cinco tiros. And for you, your full objective is to try and find as many ways to use payong as possible. And so you need to be imaginative with just like limited Mm. numbers of skills and see how many ways you can apply just that thing. Um, And I think that develops a lot of creativity within the confines of some kind of structure. I think so too. You know, you get four strikes, but you could do those four strikes. I don't know how you do them. Choose your, you know, choose your method, but um, do it that way. So, no, I I like that. um, Yeah, like they each got a role or something objective. Right. Or they'll pull something out of a hat. And you'll just yeah. write it on paper and they'll pull it out of a hat. Yeah, or so, take it to beginners right. and say, all right, just go. And you're just yep. like, <laughs> exactly. stop, pause, stop. <laughs> you just got something. <laughs> right, right. The other one I know that I do a lot with some of my, my partners out here when we practice some sparring is we will choose particular applications and we'll really try and look at them from their both offensive and defensive applications. So we will create a square on the ground of maybe about four feet by four feet. And one person will stand inside that square. And either for a while, my total intention is to try and enter into that square using an application of the thing that we're practicing and then exit from the square again without getting hit. So like do the thing, get in there and get out. And then on the other end of that, next I will be the person inside the square and the person can enter with whatever they want. And I'm trying to use the application in order to avoid their striking and to recounter instead, right? So I can work on it from being on the back foot or from being the aggressor. Um, And so, you know, trying to be imaginative about how to look at sparring as opposed to just kind of a free for all all the time, which is yeah, I think it's great. Like either do some isolations or you know particular things. Maybe they worked on in class and that kind of you know yeah. everybody's got a role. No, exactly, I, exactly. I Eric's causing trouble here. What's he saying here? <laughs> oh, Dean, all you need is one and four in the box. <laughs> that's it. That's that's absolutely it. That's all you need. <laughs> God. Um, and so um i want to speak uh, all right so have you uh ranked any folks you got some folks that have been with a decent amount of time that are you know going through the ranks you know i got a few there's some people who are in and then drop out some yeah, people who've been yeah, around for a long time and then disappear out of the out of the wind or whatever else and yeah. a couple of people you know, I have a couple of guys out on the West Coast who are, so there's a couple of guys who I've known since one of them was four and since the other one before he was born, because I used to teach capoeira to, to their mom. And so okay. he used to be there, capoeira. And so then in the later years, you know, like they would do capoeira and they did other things. And then in recent years, um, first of all, they're gigantic because they're like six foot whatever, like huge people. Um, But they are also big enough now that I don't feel bad about hitting them, which is like a ripe age. You know, they're like late teens, early 20s, you know, where you can like, oh, now I can like hit you hard and it's okay. (laughs) Like, you know, and I've been validated by knowing them for years. So no one's going to like give me crap about it, you know? Yeah. Um, But they are also at a time when their brains are just super spongy and absorbent and they're strong. Their joints still work. I know. There are no injuries. They're young. Like, yeah, you can bend down and stand back up and not make a sound. Like it's like a whole thing. So um I'm telling you, man. Yeah. So they're they're lapping it up. And um, you know, one of them is leading the study group out there, which I think has been a really cool experience too. Oh, that's nice. Okay. In young 20s to be like learning about leadership and learning about running a group and 
you know, doing that kind of thing. And then the fact that the other person is his brother means that he, his brother, and his mom also trains. So they, as a family, all train together. Oh, that's nice. Which is oh, wow. really beautiful and really brutal when they get to sparring. It's like super intense. You're like, you guys are releasing yeah. some familial something going on. Literally, uh, literally a family affair. Right? Yeah, definitely. So, you know, got those few guys out there and uh, the guy who runs the group in Idaho, um, Pat, who is a deputy sheriff out there. He had a long time, 25, 30 years in karate before. So I think mm. when he came into Kali, he just already had the mindset for what training looks like. And I think that that was something that was really special because he came there knowing, one, what it means to have to sometimes mm. just practice by yourself because sometimes students don't show up and it's just you. And he is a person who consistently does that. Or if one person shows up, like he's still there training and teaching um, and is really diligent about his practice. And so I always really respect that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I know that's a hard work. And then, you know, and then we got the guys out here in New York who have to deal with me sometimes. In, in some ways, I, I almost think it's like harder sometimes where you have had a teacher there very present with you. Mm -hmm. And then when that starts to shift, that center point is gone. And so now you have to recalibrate and create your own new balances. And I've mm. seen that in other groups, not just in Kali, but in other groups before, versus a group that has almost always been operating fairly independently. And so right from the get-go, had to establish structures for how does this community work together? How do we communicate mm. to each other? How do we support each other in the best way possible? Yeah. Um, yeah it's good stuff and we got actually uh oh sensei he is on there that's cool so yeah and he's is awesome his approach his forward thinking his isolation uh techniques is great he truly loves his students yeah wow well, that's nice. a that's a big you know that's that's big kudos if sensei he sends that out here that's like one of my you know one of those guys Oh, that's yeah, awesome. Okay, you have, I want to just touch, you have a unique way. I, I thought the way you approach your seminars is really neat, like no two ons. Oh. Um, like, and I, I, I thought that was so refreshing to hear. So, so yeah. for the folks that maybe are not aware of this or don't know, why don't you explain, like, what do you do? I think it's really neat, though. Yeah, I started doing this event maybe eight years ago, small at the time. I mean, it's called Allies. And, you know, there were a couple of things that I wanted to really make sure were a part of it. So one of them was that it wasn't just going to be kind of superstars of martial arts who I bring through. I wanted it to be folks who even, you know, me as guru, lakanguru, even as a student, were always really supportive of me, of my group, mm -hmm. that, I've, that I'd seen at seminars go out of their way to make gestures towards younger students, to really support them and do that. I, I felt like there was, I don't know how to explain, but some ineffable quality that's around support and allyship and friendship and community and partnership. So that was one of the, you know, one of the things. The other thing was, yes, I did decide that this event in particular was not going to be an event where, um, it was going to be, you know, focusing on two hunts. There would be mm -hmm. other events that do that. Um, but there are a couple of reasons for that. One, again, I, you know, I refer back to Capoeira a lot because I had a lot of time there and that definitely um, speaks to it. But there was a guy who was a teacher and I knew him for a long time. Great capoeirista, not really a guy who I liked very much, but he definitely, you know, I still listen to get the, the golden nuggets. And I remember one time him saying something about, you know, these teachers, like these old teachers who've been around for a long time, like they don't need you to be their fan. Like people already know them. They have people who, you know, have been following them and working with them. He was like, we need to be each other's fans. Like we need to be highlighting the next person, the guy over to your left and right, and kind of 
you know, really featuring them kind of the way that you do with this show, you know, like really, we're not, you know, it doesn't always have to be the guy who, you know, is yeah. the top of the heap. It just has to be a person who is trying to Ooh. do it. And so I wanted it to be focused on that. And the other part of it being that I think that it should be a reminder also to Tuhans because mm. <clears throat> the reason that we all know Tuhan Ramel in the States is because GT was bringing Tuhan and like pushing him out to the front and being like, you teach that. Or he would bring Jared and be like, Jared, like, go ahead, you teach now. Like, nice, nice. you would, you have to make space for people. And so I think it's a good reminder for us to do that. And so that at some point in time, you know, I won't be able to teach at my own event. It'll be my job to just be like, I need to find some other people who I feel like it's important for us to uplift and for us to highlight. Mm -hmm. And so I like the event to be really focused on that. Um, it's cool that Sensei E is on here because I think he's going to be our, one of our guys next year, actually, like going to fly to, how to, we're going to do the next one in Seattle. And I think he's oh, okay. going to be from Japan and spend some time with us out there. So. I think it's great what you're doing. I, I just love that where anytime that's music to my ears where people are giving opportunity that might not get it or have to wait on a basic yeah. level or popularity or, you know, whatever the reason may be. But uh, I just think that's, I, I love that. You know what I mean? And we got a comment here from Kurt. Let me just see. Within, with a combo like Hubbard and PTK, as a heavy demand of musical athletic capability, mm -hmm. what do you do when you have a student that doesn't have any musicality in their movement? They can't dance. <laughs> they have a hard time flowing. So that's his question. What do you do if, uh, if they're just not musically inclined or mm -hmm. and it's affecting their movement, I guess, you know? I mean, you know, it's it's that thing we were talking about a little bit before is trying to be really observant of where they're holding, you know, because a lot of times it is that we were saying this earlier, right? Like doing martial arts is supposed to be reminding us of things we probably already had the capacity for when I was six, seven, eight years old and just mm -hmm. didn't even give a thought to my body. I just did things. Yeah. And so now probably our job most of the time as teachers is to try and figure out what are the holding spaces, where are the places where we're clenching or kind of afraid or our body is still holding some trauma and we need to maybe be a little bit more technical and scientific on how to release that. Um, but I think a lot of times we are able to kind of talk people through it so that they can indicate some of the feeling of a thing in a very tactile way, in a very somatic way, and then then they can replicate it. So, yeah, exactly. Returning to that state of play, right? Yeah, like taking the pressure off them mentally, mate, and just letting them, yeah, because I imagine if, you know, because if you're a student, you're having a tough time. You know you're having a time. Yeah. Everybody knows that you're having a tough time. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's not a good day, but if you could just make it where, try to make them comfortable and say, hey, look, just, I want you to go back to, just look at this play. I just want you, you know what I mean? Like that could be like really helpful to them where they don't release the pressure. You know what I mean? And being able to note the moment so that it's a replicable thing. Mm. So, you know, I talk about this when we work with young people, for example, um, you know, you, I don't know, you ever been into a classroom and there's a, the kids are going crazy and the teacher is yelling. They're like, you know, you need to calm down. But I think to myself, and I remember thinking about this often, like if that, if that student has never felt what it feels like to be calm, like how are they supposed to return to that moment? Like how are they supposed to, they don't, they have no reference point for it. So even in training, there needs to be you as an observant participant or an observant teacher being able to see when the moment happens, when it's done well, and when there's like a full release there and be like, that's that moment. Like, you need to do it like that. Like, remember what that felt like? Try and yeah. do that. Thing. Yeah, piggyback off that and yeah. encourage and, yeah. Yeah. No, I, yeah, I totally agree. I love it. Yeah. And uh, Renee is saying, Sensei E is a good people. We had a lot of whiskey at the gathering. Renee and whiskey. 
I don't know. Yeah, man, Shin Valley <laughs> in general and any kind of booze, like. And uh, <laughs> all right, he's also got another complimentary comment for you. Understanding of all range from capoeira and the weapons base is fantastic. Nice. Um, which leads to my next question. How has Capoeira influenced your FMA, if it has, and full circle, has FMA influenced your Capoeira? Cool. Yeah. Um, so I nowadays I haven't been teaching Capoeira anymore. I still consider myself a Capoeira, a Capoeirista, Angolero. And so in that, been involved for maybe... 25 some odd years or something like that, oh, maybe wow. a little bit more. Um, and specifically Capoeira Angola, kind of a more traditional style of Capoeira. And, um, you know, there are a whole bunch of things that I take away from that, like from my experience, both with my teacher, with my peers, um, with my own kind of evolving and evolved relationship with the art. Some of it was definitely for good things and some for really challenging ones. Um, so some of the great things I think with Capoeira were that <clears throat> there was always this real reminder of the importance of remembering where things come from. Mm -hmm. And I think that that still remains with me as a reference point in terms of how do I, t how do I treat Grand Tuhan, our old teachers, guest teachers, Capoeira, especially Capoeira Angola, is full historically of profound teachers who died poor in some favela in Brazil. Yeah. While their students, you know, who just knew how to navigate the system, you know, made all kind of money and like did everything else and like disappeared off into the world and kind of forgot this teacher. Forgot their roots or where they got, yeah. yeah. And so, you know, for as much as I know that some of the practitioners, some who come on here, some in other places who are like, yeah, you know, we're thinking about the future. We're thinking about taking the art and evolving it and growing and blah, blah, blah. Like, don't forget who did a lot of stuff so that you could just kick it on Saturday and do it. You know, like mm -hmm. you get to hang out on Sunday and hang out with your friends when somebody else was doing this for a long time when it wasn't popular. And, and they were struggling. They may still, still be struggling. They may still be struggling. And so Capoeira, I feel like, definitely always reminded me that that was an important thing to keep in mind and keep as part of your reference. And then also, you know, as a person who is teaching Capoeira, when I bring teachers to teach at Allies, like, mm -hmm. I make sure I pay them fairly because I mm -hmm. think it's important for us to start establishing a model wherein we look at the amount of time. If you did... I don't know, Dean, how long have you been doing martial arts? Yes, it's going on 30. Yeah, something you, would, like that. you would have like two doctorates. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, if you think that, no, really, like, you know, if we think. We don't, that, I mean, much to your point. Yeah, yeah. We would be, you know, and, and oftentimes we don't look at cultural arts in the same way as we do kind of classic arts. Um, and so we diminish the amount of responsibility we have to the people who kind of like hold that art or mm. you know, being able to pay them or at least, you know, kind of express the fact that there's a certain level of gratitude. And so that I definitely got instilled with me a lot in Capoeira. Um, this idea of being very in your body and being very physical and self-expression. Um, so yeah. with Capoeira Angola in particular is very like, no two people should it look the same. Why do you say that with African arts? Because in Piper, we stress that. Like what I do in Piper, um, we might got the same Lego pieces, but you should yeah. not look like me. Yeah. And you know what I mean? But it seems, mm -hmm. it just seems that that's like really just in like 52 blocks. I'm taking that with this guy, Ken. And he kind okay. of referenced that. Yeah. Why is it? Is that is that kind of stressed in there? I or is it? There's an element, so historically when people talk a lot about capoeira, at least from a surface level, there's a lot of old mythos where people would be like, oh, you know, the the enslaved Africans like would, dis would disguise fighting as dancing. But the truth of the matter is, since 
dancing out in the street was often also considered like a misdemeanor and you would get arrested. That doesn't really make a lot of sense. Like you disguise the crime as another crime and then like still get arrested. Like there's old folklore. Hey, we're going to do this because it, it's going to sell. It sounds good. Yeah, you know what right. I mean? The truth of the matter is that kind of historically, they just didn't create a divide between things that were going to be artistic, things that were going to be physical and things that were going to be spiritual. And they were like, we do all of those things simultaneously. And thus it's not worthwhile for the Brazilian team to score a goal if they don't score a goal beautifully. You know, they don't want to just shoot, you know, like basketball. We don't want to just shoot a basket or whatever we want to do it. And it also be beautiful. And so I think a lot about that when I do Kali, you know, not to say I'm the most graceful, but I should remind myself in the art that I'm as graceful as I can be. Like I'm fully myself in the moment that I'm doing a beautiful thing. And in some regard, I think when we remind ourselves of that grace, it kind of, um, it pulls your muscles into the right position, your posture mm. aligns better, your structure, because your mental is informing the way that you're using your body. Yeah. You know? It's so interesting. It just seems though, like the African art, it, they really, indirectly, I'll say, I don't know about, I don't know about directly, but it's big in that, like yeah. self-expression, yeah. like, you should have this unique look. We can learn from you and learn from each other because you might find something to do or do something different. And then we're going to be like, Hey, you know, how did you pick that up? You know, how'd you come yeah. up with that? You know, what made you come up with that movement? And um, I don't know if I see that as much in other arts as I do. And I would never notice if I had not yeah. been exposed to Piper, what you just mentioned, and then 52 yeah. blocks. I don't know. Yeah. 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 So, you know, I mean, I definitely think it informs at least what I do in Capoeira and how I do FMA. I definitely would say, obviously, in the early time of my bikini, it was just fundamentals. You know, it was like, okay, yeah, you just yeah. need to yeah, you learn you this way and that. But then you, you get to a point and you're like, oh, now where do I get to put some hot sauce on that? And where do I put yeah. some in here and there? And whatever. That's good. I mean, no, yeah, I mean, right, because it should be in, it should be an FMA too. Like, yeah. instead of having a bunch of robots. No, I'm not saying it's not. I don't want to get misconstrued here. It just seems like the African arts, it's kind of just known, you know what I mean? And all that. Yeah. And again, I'm, you know, I'm not saying everybody in FMA systems like that uh, is all, but. As you um, know, you've done some C lot before. Yeah, Dean, you've done some. Oh, some yeah, yeah, C-Lot. absolutely. And it's also so, part of the. Uh, Piper too. So both okay. as a separate so, and kind of the Piper version of how they implement it in there. You know? Yeah. We have a, a good friend out here, Mandala Jeanette, who lives out in New Jersey, and she's a percussionist. Mm-hmm. And it, a couple of cool times where we did class and she either played in person or brought some recordings of um Kulentan, which is like um Kind of they have it in Silat as well, but it's a, a kind of percussion, percussive series of bells that get okay. played. Okay. And so, but it's Filipino. And so we would play that music at the same time as having class. Now, not to say we couldn't play just like contemporary music, but sometimes, and which I do, um, but it was really interesting also to at times play that and to be like, mm-hmm. oh, what was the nature and the sensibility of rhythm that whoever was originating this had in mind. Like, what what were they feeling time looked like? How did they feel rhythm looked in that time? Um, And so how might that have influenced the design of particular series of practices and things like Mm. that? Yeah, it's just, uh, it's just one of the things that just I find interesting and it's it stood out, you know what I mean, from a, just an observation. But uh, here, this is a good point. I have to agree with GM Ron here. If you go unique, you get criticized. And um, I think, unfortunately, there could be some truth to that. Like, you know, like, here's this guy developing his own way. Like, what are you doing? How come you're not, how come you're not buying the syllabus? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, and uh, all right, we yeah. got, uh, oh, we got your friend here. <laughs> uh, Nikiti, we have footwork on the takeoff. And the capoeira footwork has incredible principle of ranging in its attack and counters. 
Dancing in May is also quite known. History, yeah. Yeah, the hiding the movements, you know, and all that. And we do in Corinza, yeah. 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 Yeah, so, you know, I think that it, it definitely, like, things have to become something to the body of the practitioner, and uh, that's just going to happen. And some people will just have that innately or be more comfortable with, you know, I think it's, I think you hit a, I think you hit a point there. Like some of it is just going to be innate. Like they, yeah. like people are going to aspire to like, not just look at the syllabus. They're going to put their own flair on it. They don't even need to be told it. It's just something yeah. innate, organic. And, you know, I agree. Because with otherwise you. they're going to feel dissatisfied. Yeah, like if they don't right. get to do that, they're going to feel like, oh, this isn't for me. Yeah, like I okay, I just don't want to sell this. I, I don't want to and nothing wrong with the syllabus. I mean, but I want to go beyond the syllabus. I want, you know what I mean? And I want to actually have a creative aspect, self-creation to what I'm doing, you know. And I agree. Um there are oftentimes I will say though that I will do things in sparring. And someone later will be like, whoa, what was that? Did you like make that move? And I'm like, no, that's actually like just reverse triangle. Just when people spar, sometimes it like they narrow down what they're doing a lot. And I'm, I really make the effort when I'm sparring, as, even though, you know, sometimes I get hit or like whatever else. Yeah. I'm like trying to use the stuff. Like I'm trying to do the. Like things yeah. like I'm trying to use ranging, various types of footwork that we use from the curriculum. I might put it together in in you know creative ways, but oftentimes I'm trying to be mindful about certain things that I want to see if they actually work in this context. Mm. And so people will see them and be like, "Whoa, where did that come from?" I'm like, "That came from year one." You know, curriculum, yeah, <laughs> or... thing, you know. But that's true, so, though. You should. It's like, I mean, if you, when you look at sparring, it's experimental. We're not fighting. Like, you're yeah. working, or you should be having objectives, I think. Except, oh, all right, I'm going to go out there and uh, try him and not get hit. Okay, well, I think you can go deeper in that. I'm gonna, okay, I want to play with this. And if I fail, I'll look at ways to improve it, or I'll maybe I have to disregard it because it's just something that's just not going to work for me for whatever reason. Right. You know what I mean? But yeah. uh, I think that's the approach to have. You know what I mean? With sparring, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, let it go. In sparring, you should try things. Too <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I definitely, we should definitely have whiskey yeah. with Renee. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I have a feeling that will be quite. An evening, <laughs> but uh, all right. If you could do another FMA system, like if you had the time and you had the desire, and you could free yourself to do it and immerse yourself into it, what what F other FMA system do you think you'd like to do? Oh man, wow. Um. So. Uh, no hints or anything, but just uh, yeah, I know. Like that, that that probably <laughs> would be the one. You know, that probably be the one. You know, I mean, I feel like even and I and I've had some conversations with kid about that at a time, like because we were looking at systems that actually developed a whole bunch again, like uh, of uh, long range capacity that had like specific distinctive things that were outliers from Piketty and that felt mm. like though that they bridge super, you know, clearly systematically, perhaps even that are already existing in Piketty. Like, although mm. I don't know if you're supposed to say that out loud, like the things that are like things that are fusing over. Um, but yeah, so some illustrismo, you know, some more time in some lightning scientific, mm. um, yeah, those would probably be the things. I would love to actually just get to spend a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with Bobby Tabuada, you know, of course. Yeah, you know, <laughs> just like, sometimes you just like need to be super close to a lot of dangerous stuff to just get out yeah. of your head. So um, I think that there's like a, a little bit of that. Too. I'm seeing him this weekend. Um, so oh, yeah. Right on. yeah we're, doing, we're all doing a seminar together. Um, and uh, he, of course, is going to be a highlight. And, and, and well, you know, well deservedly so. And but he yeah. he's so dynamic in so many ways. His charisma, his you know what I mean. The thing he does incredibly well. You know what I mean. Blunt yeah. Um, 
yeah so uh yeah it's interesting um yeah we'll see how it goes but uh you know it's funny when i asked this question because i kind of keep track okay what is the most mentioned system that somebody if they had a time and desire they would do and i'm not just saying it because i do and i love it but yeah ai is comes up the most yeah yeah I mean, Blinter, Blinter Walk good is reason. yeah, for absolutely good reason. Yeah. 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 Blinter Walk has come up a few times. Yeah. Non bikini people have, you know, have said, oh, yeah, bikini, you know. Um, it's just, I, I always just uh, like finding out just to, just out of curiosity. I'm more, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. whether people would, what they would do or choose to do. I mean, there's to like a, it's an interesting thing, too, though, because I, I do feel sometimes like, so with bikini, um that so there are two two things that sometimes occur to me one is that people are like oh i need to do this other thing and that thing um but part of it is maybe because they just didn't have enough exposure to know like some of that stuff is already existing within their own system so you know i'm pretty fortunate like i said to spend a lot of time with like 200 ramel and and stuff and to be like, oh, actually there's like a whole bunch of stuff around that too. And there's a whole bunch of stuff around this and that and the other thing. So then I can be discerning about what are the other things I wanna kind of go out of the system to, to learn and to kind of work on. Um, then there are other things where I feel like um, sometimes people disregard a thing mm -hmm. um, because they're like, it's just too hard to learn. Um, but I'm a patient person, so I'm not really, in, in terms of my own learning at least, in that I'm not in a real rush. Like, I, I know that I have enough tools in my belt to be able mm -hmm. to function in the Kali world. And so now for these other things, I'll take as much time as it takes to kind of discern what things I truly don't have the capacity for and what things I just haven't worked on. Yeah. yeah, right. I think and that comes along with anything, maturity being in the game where you could just, like you said, discern what you think will fit you well or maybe not sure. Yeah. But, um, yeah. yeah. If I see a so value in like, yeah. like you, if I see a value in it, I'll take the time to play around with the experiment yeah. and, you know, and kind of reap the benefits from it. Yeah. You know, exactly. I, yeah. And then I can that, things outside of that you know oh it's paulo is out yeah, there yeah fun and dangerous puzzle to play with it's, yeah especially with Bobby. uh yeah <laughs> he just woke up from a nap <laughs> yeah man. yeah get that rest up <laughs> super smart yeah definitely oh, articulate. yeah uh so what are your future uh goals like for you yourself system <laughs> i mean what you got going on coming down the pike yeah, I mean, as far as overall, I just um, want to see some people growing. <clears throat> I think like there is definitely, you know, and, and everyone has it for themselves as well. Um, it's plateau points or stymieing points. And so because every person is so distant, the different um it's, you know, it's a constant work to try and figure out how to help people and support people and growing past those things. Um, and everybody needs something different from, from me or from themselves, because that's, you know, what my largest goal is, is just be like to see more folks, both in my group and in the system overall, like to see them grow. Um, I would really love to see, um, for myself, I would love to be involved a lot more in the work in, of developing community. Um, so maybe firstly in Pekiti, and um, that has to do with developing new modes and method for communication between teachers, between students, between organizations, and just being a part of that process. And then also more universally in FMA and then in martial arts as well. Um, so those things are all, I guess, for me, goals in the art. As far as the training, I mean, that's just going to happen as it happens. Like, I'll be doing that, and um, yeah. we'll go to wherever I go to in that. But some of those other things, I think. I just think 
you seem you seem so genuine that you generally really care about your students and their growth, and um, they're lucky to have you. I mean, I could I could feel that resonate, Thank you, you know, during this interview. You know what I mean? That you generally really care about their future and growth. You want to be part of a community. You want to be good people, and you know, have a you know have goals and have a yeah. purpose, and you know. And you, I, I'm, you know, he can hear it from you. And I think that's just great. I think a lot of people could learn from you. Um, I would love to uh, do something with you. Uh, you just seem like a great cat. You know what I mean? Uh, mm, and, anytime, you know, anytime for sure. Yeah, we'll have to, because uh, I've been talking with Royce and a few others. Um, I'm, you know, getting together with other folks that are kind of close in that. And uh, I think it'd be really fun getting together with you and doing something with a few other cats, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we got here, we got some uh, Renee, some Grand Supremo advice. <laughs> it's not a twist on something else, is it, uh, Renee? <laughs> you see, yeah, absolutely. You remind me of me. I don't know if you're so caring, Renee. <laughs> oh, you know what, Renee? <laughs> you are in your own way. Uh, all right, Eric, Renee, if you having technical technique problems, I feel bad for you. <laughs> all right, Paolo. Yeah, see. man, I have not had a chance to train with Grandmaster Pogi. That's the one thing. I feel like Paolo's Grandmaster Pogi has kind of gone silent. No, oh my God. I'm actually making a video for him. I'm a student. Oh, really? Oh, my God. Because I, yeah, I, I feel like he's very, gone very close. And I yeah. missed the boat on the, the trainings. Well, so. he goes in and out. Sometimes he gets mm. just fed up with the community and he'll kind of just go I can in his see own that. place for a while. So I then he has to that. touch base with his nephew, Paolo. What's going on, right. Uncle? Can you kind of bring him back? Bring him back into the forefront? I can see and that. So there's that yeah. kind of struggle. You know what I mean? Yeah. But he's real. <laughs> don't, don't, GM Pogi is real. And yeah, <laughs> I'm all in for sure. Uh, yeah, so he's humble, uh, not as humble as me. Nobody's as humble as you. Um, oh my God! Most people don't. Most people don't <laughs> recognize that about you, Renee. I know you're you're misunderstood. Yeah. <laughs> oh man! All right. Well, hey, I appreciate you coming on. This has been great. Any what are your final um, thoughts for the community? Um, you seem like such an insightful <laughs> guy and all that. What do you, you know, what could you, what would you like to tell the community as a whole? No, I mean, I, like I said, I really appreciate and I'm honored to be on. I know you oftentimes have all these heavy hitters on here and stuff. And so I appreciate, you know, just being able to be on here and talk to you and share some stuff with folks and everything. And, um, <clears throat> Yeah, I don't I don't really know if I have much words for wisdom. I think if you keep the intentions good, you'll do faulty stuff. You know, I, I'm sure I'm kind of a pain in the ass to a lot of my my students and teachers as well, you know what I mean? But I don't think that as a general rule, people think my intentions aren't straight ahead, you know, like that I'm not oh, there I'm sure. for yeah, people... full, full force. So try and keep that going. I think that's fair. I guess, I mean, you seem just very genuine um, in there. So, and then the comments are reflecting that too. And uh, we got your buddy again saying, fantastic show, cool guy to Sensei Dean and Adelon. All right. Hey, well, this has been a pleasure. I really enjoyed this. Um, you seem, again, you seem like you're a great guy and your students, I feel lucky to have you. Yeah, thank you so much, man. I appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. These are, you know, and again, our show's not about just getting heavy hitters on here. It's it's giving people like you that obviously have something to offer. And you certainly do what you've communicated here and your value systems to your students and your appreciation for community and et cetera. So, cool. I don't know. Thank you. You're a heavy hitter in your own way. So, <laughs> all right. Hey, it's been a pleasure. And uh, you take care. All right. You take care. All right. And folks, that wraps up episode 416. Who is next? Who is next? I'll tell you who is next. Burton Richardson, next Friday. But I know we got somebody before that. But that just came to mind. Next Friday at 3 o'clock. 
Burton, and he's always kind of fun. What he's got coming down the pipeline, guys always coming up with some stuff to do. And um, yeah, Kelly Warren will be coming on soon for his camp. And who else is left in June? Uh, I'm having uh, Jason. Jason will be back on. He's going to be talking about the World War II combatants. Yeah. Um, he seems pretty knowledgeable on that. So we're going to hear about that. I don't know about it. Uh, don't know much about it, just other than I heard of World War II combatants. So that'd be interesting. And I think he's going to be next week, actually, along with Burton. I think, yeah. Anyway, this weekend, big weekend, um, North Carolina, I've made a discussion on the road. We're going to see how it goes. And if it goes successful, hopefully we will do more. Hopefully. Right. So just testing out the East Coast for now. And what we got for comments. That's being that they're not as smart as me either. Great show. Yes, fantastic. Yeah, bald. Oh my God. And the lighting was decent. Thank you, Renee. Seek out Najoli if you're on the East Coast. He's a bad man, all right. That doesn't even need to be mentioned, but glad you did. All right. All right, all right guys. So uh, thank you for jumping and watching. And hopefully I will see you guys next week with uh, either Jason or Catch Burton. Um, again, Burton's going to be talking about some programs he's got coming down. One of them just got released. I think it was today or yesterday, the trapping, hand trapping. Looks pretty good. Um, something I got to check out. Add more to the or stuff that I don't have time for. Uh, go find me to get it. <laughs> I know. I got to replace that. You know, it's one of those things you know you have to do, but you just don't get around to doing it because you think of 10 other things that you would rather do than replace a blind. But, yes, that is an Dire need to replace him. <laughs> All right, folks. I will see you uh, hopefully next week. All right. I'll talk to you. Have a good weekend.